This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. It is a beautiful day to open your sportsbook app because not only do we have an eight-game slate in the NBA, but we have a full menu of offerings available for the Players' Championship at TPC Sawgrass. Once again, a loaded field for this week. We're going to talk about both that NBA slate and the Players' Championship by talking to Brandon Gandula and getting his read on everything you can bet on over at FanDuel Sportsbook for this week maybe not everything there might be a bit of a an oversell there this is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel podcast network and numberfire.com my name is Jim Sonis I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com joined here as mentioned by Brandon Gandula he is a senior managing editor of numberfire.com Brandon do you have takes on let's see here um what's the dumbest thing I can pull up we're not dumb you can bet this um do you have uh cycling thoughts for me Uh, was not prepared to answer cycling. I thought we were table going, tennis. I thought we were going over uh, surfing and rugby league and rugby union, which are very different things. Uh, I know most people boxing. don't know the difference, but boxing. Um, I used to be into boxing a little bit. Um, okay, well we'll find something. Australian rules football is really I've fun said to this watch. on Slack, Australian rules football is the coolest sport that there is. It's not. Not a lie. Um, I've been at the gym on like a Saturday morning and it's been on and I've like, it's extended my workout. So I feel like I should get into it just from like a cardio perspective. Like it might be better for me if I, cause like if they put it on, I just get distracted and don't realize how long I've been going. Um, yeah. So like, I, I, I agree with this. This is a good take. It's like, it's like soccer meets rugby meets like American football guys. Just get it. Like get the ball run down the field then they just punt it and i'm like i don't know why like i don't know why that happened but it was cool yeah and then Uh, like they get to a certain point then they like touch it down then they got to kick it through uprights and i don't mm -hmm. really know what's happening Mm -hmm. and as a sports fan growing up with like the the big sports like i know the intricacies of sports yeah it's very foreign to be watching a sport and be like i don't really know what's happening see the better thing is playing a sport where you don't know what's happening uh in high school grew up in minnesota we played snow rugby basketball where it's in the snow you're playing with a basketball hoop but there is no dribbling and tackling is fully okay no. uh no broken bones somehow i don't think there were any concussions confirmed uh from the entire time somehow uh so like it's actually decently safe sometimes um so i would propose john sheeran uh get snow rugby basketball odds posted at FanDuel sportsbook so i can be pro in something else other than talking for going, some time going pro and yeah. uh I also snow couldn't shoot basketball. even in snow rugby basketball, to be fully honest. It was not my strength regardless. Just I might be bad, bad well, at if, things hey, look, that involve you're... coordination. Is it, wait, is it just like shooting a basketball through a hoop? You, you, I mean, it was a, a small hoop, so you could in theory dunk, but that would also require me to get to the hoop to dunk. Small it was a sport. small basketball too. Like you could palm it. Okay. Well, I can help you with your shooting form if you need. I'm not going to shoot. Well, I thought you wanted to go pro. There's no three-point line, so like, why would I shoot? Dunk. <clears throat> Dunks hey. only. Hey, man. Guess you're not an innovator. I want snow snow rugby basketball back in my life. A eh? maybe that's not great to play post thirty. Like that seems like that could be dangerous. Like ah, oh, when you're nineteen, it's probably fine. When you're thirty one, maybe it's my right, thirty. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. It, yeah, thirty one. Okay. Whew. Anyway, let's talk about some NBA in a bit here. Uh, we'll get Brandon Gadula's thoughts on tonight's NBA slate. We'll talk about the Players' Championship as well, all in just a second. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. Dr. Ed Fang is back with us tomorrow to talk about uh, some men's college basketball conference tournaments. We'll talk about Northwestern being the two seed in the Big Ten because I'm going to force him to. Why not? Uh, we'll talk about some other stuff there. We'll have that on next week, too, on Monday to break down the NCAA tournament to help you win your pools. Uh, All that coming up here on the Covering the Spread podcast feed. So make sure you're subscribed wherever you get your podcast to get that right as it goes live. 
Are you looking to have a stake in the Players' Championship all weekend? Well, FanDuel has you covered with the PGA Eagle Contest, now live in the DFS tab. Test your knowledge of the PGA Tour by putting together a six-person lineup while staying under the salary cap and using FanDuel's live scoring feature. Follow along as you compete for a share of $200,000 with first place taking them $40,000 all for just $7.77. Whether it's household names like John Rahm and Roy McIlroy or some lesser known golfers who think may be sleepers teeing up on March 9th on Thursday, there are plenty of options for you to fill out a lineup as you compete for first place. Thursday will be here before you know it. So submit your lineups on FanDuel today eligibility restrictions apply go to fanduel.com or download the fanduel app for more details we'll talk more about the players in just a bit here but let's start things off by talking about the nba brand a couple of national tv games for tonight those are the 76ers at the wolves we got the grizzlies at the lakers looking at those two specifically anything stand out to you there at fanduel right now uh 76ers played last night um had a high scoring win um Timberwolves been off since Saturday, which ended a four game road trip for them. So they should be rested and ready to go. They're more or less healthy um, in terms of their key key pieces, but don't have an official injury report as of we didn't have it as of 830. I don't know if we have it as of 930, but probably not for the Sixers do uh, to the back to back. Yeah, it's still still empty, but Tobias Harris, um, probably not likely to, to suit up from what I can glean. But what matters is the, the 76ers splits with Embiid and James Harden. Tyrese Maxey in there as well for me. Uh, but with those three, uh, this team's 18-2, and two, net rating of only uh, plus 2.7, but a really good offensive rating of 119.7. Uh, so good marks overall uh, for this team. Timberwolves with their relevant splits, a little bit more recent since the deadline. Um bit lighter there, minus one net rating, but a 116 and a half offensive rating. League average depends on the source you go to, but around 114. So both the offense is well above uh, the league average in, in that uh, sense. But once you account for rest, home court advantage, I do have the uh, the Timberwolves as modest favorites by 3.2. Are they still favored by one here? It's two now. Two. So not, a, not, not quite as good, um, but I, I would still back them there. Uh, but my favorite uh, path to this game is the over. Again, both teams have good offenses. Uh, my model has it at 232.8 um, to give us some breathing room. Um, I should have this pulled up as well, but is it it's still 229 and a half right now? Okay. Um, so you mentioned you had the Wolves favored by 3.2. They're two point favorites right now. What's like your threshold, if you have one, as far as like I need X points of value or to in order to like make it something I feel good about? I usually like to see two points difference. Yeah, okay. Um, that one I think has been sliding. I think I think it was one before yeah. uh, we started here. But um, I like look. There's generally enough opportunity with the NBA each night where I don't want to force things. It'll right. depend on what else is available, and sometimes I'll lower that, which is not good process. So I'm not really recommending it. Everyone should have their their limits and stick to it. But also, I think it's important where you know. I'm still skeptical of something that even is maybe a point and a half different. Yeah. Just because I'm quite risk averse. Sure. When it comes to NBA. I'd rather make no to, bet than a bad bet. And then when it comes to golf, I'm I'm still pretty risk averse, but I know that there's yeah. golf's just high risk. So yeah. it's a weird, uh weird combination to talk both NBA and golf. But yeah, my my preferred route here uh is the over due to the good offenses. Okay, so we like the over on 76ers Wolves. That's a 229 and a half right now. Brandon mentioned he has it around 232 uh, for that one. So let's talk about the other game here. That is uh, the Grizzlies and the Lakers. Uh, Grizzlies, a quiet team recently. Not, not really in the news too much. Um, so surprised to see them here. Any thoughts for you on this one? Yeah, don't like it. Um, I don't like uncertainty. There's a lot uh, of things I, not to like there. That's fair. <laughs> uh, I just talked about like being risk averse, even whenever the, the numbers show a little bit of value. But again, that comes from your personal risk tolerance. And, and that's important to understand uh, as an individual better. But yeah, lots going on with the Grizzlies. Um, obviously, John Morant suspended. Brandon Clark just towards Achilles. Steven Adams still out. Um, but the Lakers, they're not necessarily in a position to... Uh, take advantage either. LeBron James is listed as out. D'Angelo Russell is questionable. Anthony Davis is probable uh, for this one. They just beat Golden State by eight. Um, so 
you know, they're still a capable team, but the long-term splits without LeBron James, surprisingly, um, by which I mean, ironically, it's unsurprising that they're, they're a much better team with LeBron James, their what? net net rating. So if you look at their offensive rating or sorry, their net rating with LeBron versus without them, it's a 9.6 point differential um, <clears throat> straight up. There are minus six without him. So you don't love to see that. Purely based on the data, if I pull like the relevant samples, you know, without John Moran and the the Grizzlies guys, without LeBron, you know, D'Angelo Russell, but with like Anthony, Diego, all that kind of stuff. If I look just purely based at the numbers, uh, my model has Memphis favored by two point three, but I am not touching uh, this game from that sense. I'd rather bet the under. Um, the the Lakers' offensive rating is very very bad with the current lineup. Memphis is is kind of still decent. Uh, but I don't really want to get access to backing the, the Grizzlies right now. And I would understand uh, some struggles for both sides in terms of the offense. So the under is uh, the play here for me. I talked about this in like week two in the NFL when I kept trying to bet the Cardinals, uh, which was bad. Um, I needed a vibes meter in my model. Have you considered yeah. a vibes meter um, to nullify value on the Grizzlies? Wait, did you ask if I have one or I I'm asking, one? have you considered it? You should oh. implement it. Well, so that's the, that's the weird thing. Um, but yeah, the is, vibes are weird. Yes. Yeah. The vibes are weird, but we're not going to open we Cause we spent time talking about like Australian rules football. We don't really have time to open up the, the box of like the vibes meter. <laughs> well, like, how, like if you, cause I, you know, I'm, I'm assuming you, unless you really implemented the vibes meter, we, have our inputs that we believe in and we put those in and then why would you assume I wouldn't put that in? <laughs> you know me. <laughs> but like I don't like to get into the well, here's why this is too high or too low. It's like, well if they've played this way without like John yeah. Moran and Brandon Clark and like this is what I should think because this is what's actually sort of happening. I don't like that. I don't like that yeah. uncertainty. And yeah. then therefore I don't want part of like backing them at all. Uh, so again, I'm sticking with the under. I don't have a vibes meter. Um, if I had known I was going to be questioned about a vibes meter, I would have had a better, better response. But honestly, going on this show, you should have known you'd be questioned about a vibes meter. Like just that's that's, that's on you, bro. That's and on you. Which narratives exist for yeah. rotation players? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so under 226, where Brandon sees value for Grizzlies and Lakers that late game on TNT. But it is an eight game slate. So six other games we have not yet discussed. Anything else stand out to you right now? Um, unsurprisingly, I like the Knicks money line. That's minus five ten. But I, I was looking for money line parlays, which I, I do like whenever I see value on heavy favorites. Not necessarily loving another favorite to pair them with. I, I you know, my model likes Milwaukee well enough, but Orlando is kind of weird whenever they get to play at home. So I'm probably staying away from that one. But you know, if you're really like, if you're really feeling it, um. Probably Dallas would be the, the place that I would go there uh, next if you're looking for that. But I think that it's pretty safe to uh, put the Knicks money line with any other bets that you like. Just something I'm thinking about because uh, I don't really see them losing this one. But other than that, I like taking the points uh, for the Thunder. Uh, it was four and a half. It's now four, which is a little less fortunate. But, um, you know, they need some wins right now. The Warriors are, as we've talked about numerous times, feels like we talk about the Warriors and the Lakers a lot on these Tuesday uh, spots, but they're not they're not a good uh, road team. Just haven't traveled particularly well at a certain point. That matters to me. Um, Oklahoma City, like so again, I just input the data. Let that like with the adjustments of home court rest, things like that take hold. But in addition to that, whenever I'm uncertain, I like to look at some trends to see if like there's something a little bit more there, but Oklahoma city at home covering uh, pretty well, 58.8% uh, of the games um, tend to score well relative to their implied team total at home. So that, t that to me says that uh, they kind of bring it at home with the offense. And that helps me uh, want to back them and just take the points uh, as well. So there was, um, a report yesterday that SGA is going to have like minute restrictions going forward. It doesn't sound like it'll be like 20 minutes. Um, it's going to be like reduced from what he's been playing, which is a lot. Um, 
how much is that worth to you anecdotally? Because obviously, like, it's tough to model that out. Yeah. But, like, anecdotally, how much is that worth to you with regards to the spread? It is, but it's nice to see in this instance the the spread moving. Um, Correct. With confirmation with, that other people agree with you despite that report. And the fact that uh, I don't necessarily believe a ton in the Warriors on the road with sure. you know their current their current rotation. So I'm um, feeling pretty solid with that still. Uh, okay. And and I don't think that it's going to be to the point where, um, like it's going to be it, you know it could be blah but yeah the, the data says that it, it's still a uh, still a great way uh, to to get access to this game. Yeah, so that's still the Thunder plus four right now. Other things mentioned or the Knicks money line uh, now minus four eighty right now versus the Hornets. Um, you also have uh, the Bucks minus two eighty as a potential add on there. The Mavericks, the other one mentioned, they are minus three seventy. Bit of movement towards the Hornets because um, it was 510 for the Knicks. It's now 480. So keep an eye on that. But um, just a, a note that it did. Now, now it's, it may, might as well be a pick them now. Yeah, exactly. Just nervous, shaking in my boots. No, what's going on here. Okay. Uh, that's going to wrap up the NBA for today. Let's shift focus now and talk about the Players Championship. We are at TPC Sawgrass for this weekend, Brandon. It's a pretty unique course where there are a lot of factors to consider. What should people know about this course before taking a look at the odds? It's tough. <laughs> it's tough. It's high variance. Um, water's in play virtually everywhere. 17 of 18 holes, 88 bunkers. It's just a high variance event every year. Uh, last year's leaderboard, looking back, like we know that Cam Smith won, but uh, the top like 15 was pretty wild that's not to say it's random that's not to say that like it was pretty livy can... too very livy leaderboard yeah um it, but like it's it's not random and it's not like to the point where oh anybody can win i mean a lot of guys can win because one of the key things here is that off the tee accuracy wins out over distance and anytime that happens that brings a lot more golfers into play because they're not necessarily like there are certain golfers who are, who can be penalized at a longer course where distance is just a huge advantage. Whenever you get rid of that, the shorter hitters who are about as good at other things, generally, you know, have the good short games to contend if they're not, if they're losing distance off the tee consistently, then it's sort of an even playing field. Um, that being said, like, accuracy is never the only stat you should look at. Like there's a lot more to golf than hitting fairways, especially if you're um, struggling with the irons, but it's, it's punishing to miss the fairways here, be in the wrong spots off the tee. Penalties are hard to overcome again, tons of water, lots of bunkering. Um, Cause it's just not an easy course. Otherwise you're not going to be having a ton of birdie and Eagle chances. Um, just not going to be a score fest. So along with that, greens are a bit smaller than the usual PGA tour stop, which again puts added uh, emphasis on hitting the fairways, getting good lies, getting good angles. Wind can be an issue, probably going to be a bit of an issue uh, this week. So volatility is the key. If you're asking me for key stats, I still want to have strokes and approach at the top because it's just the most important stat um, that accounts for the par threes. Uh, but Strokesing it off the tee with a lean toward driving accuracy is important. Then from there, it's basically just hoping that your guys don't find themselves with like a bad gust or, you know, a water ball, uh, which a lot of guys are going to have and it's going to derail things. So uh, f fight the, the instinct to think that your first round leaders are going to be there all four days. Uh, if you're outright to get off to a slow start, it's not over. Yeah. Um, the wind is not terrible this week, at least compared to last week. Uh, right. Max of like 12 miles per hour. There is some rain in the forecast Friday afternoon, um, but later in the day Friday, so might not get there in time, but at least not as bad as last week where it was pretty, pretty gusty uh, for both afternoons. Uh, at the top of the odds board, we have Rory McIlroy plus 850. Scotty Scheffler is 10 to 1. John Rahm 11 to 1. Now, when... Uh, things opened yesterday. McElroy and Rom are both plus 850, and Rom is lengthened to 11 to 1. So, do you think this is an overreaction to Rom being human last week, or is it appropriate given that you mentioned 
accuracy matters more here. More guys can compete. Rom, more of a bomber. McElroy, that kind of applies to here as well, though he has one here uh, somewhat recently. So what's your read on those top guys, McElroy, Scheffler, and Rom at their respective odds? Well, if you're asking me if it's an overreaction to what we saw from John Rom last week, absolutely. Um, <laughs> golf betting odds are hilarious to watch if you track things like very closely yeah. because a lot of it is reactionary. Um, and s- believe it or not, I, you know, I've studied this four rounds of data, not that predictive of, of anything, um, especially when we're looking at someone such as a John Rom. But look, I, I cite finishing positions because it's easy. Um, I don't really like to cite finishing positions that much because they're, they're very volatile, you know, a putt or two that falls for a guy or doesn't fall for a guy could be the difference between like a T10 and like a T25. Um, if it's a really clustered event, uh, a penalty shot can do the same, like one, you know, a triple, I mean, not for Kurt Kitayama, <laughs> this week he could have as many as he wanted and, and still go on to win. But, um, you know, a penalty shot can drop someone 15 spots and that's why we need to be looking at the underlying data. But, uh, I mean, whenever you see like really strong finishing positions, that's largely indicative of good play. Yes. But that's going to shorten someone's odds. If you have someone like Rom fall off a little bit and then Rory and Scheffler be it all over the the coverage come Sunday, that's going to stick in people's minds. That's going to change the way that people want to bet. So yeah, it is an overreaction. Mm -hmm. That being said, even while I still have John Rom as the favorite this week, it's pretty it's pretty flat relative to to other weeks where there's more variance this week. Um, course fit favoring some guys who have longer odds. So I don't see Rom uh, as someone I could bet. I have him around. This is gonna, this probably sound weird, uh, but I have Rom and Scheffler around fourteen to one, and, and Rory around like sixteen to one. If we're if I'm like if I were putting it to be completely fair, yeah. So I'm not betting the top guys because of the way that the variance is for this course, but yeah, it is an overreaction. And if you're going to bet one of them for me, it's just going to be Rom at the better number. I mean, it does sound like those are long odds, but also like, I mean, sports books don't want to get skewered on favorites. They're going to, yeah, a lot of the hold will come from favorites. Yeah. Like that's kind of how things work. And, so and- the <laughs> fact that they're overvalued is not a shock. And, and the way that those three specifically are golfing. I know yeah. we got to forgive John Rum for one, yeah. one bad week whenever he was very clearly like very flustered uh, with the setup. But those three guys specifically right now deserve to be where they are, even yeah. if mathematically I'm not going to bet them. So we're not backing the favorites here between McElroy, Scheffler, and Rom. When you look elsewhere in the outright market, Brandon, anything stand out to you in terms of being a good value? Not as much as I would hope, especially <laughs> for how overvalued I see the favorites. Three names are jumping out to me. Um, and if if I when I looked yesterday, three names jumped out. If I looked just this morning, only one of those threes really would jump out. But yeah. they're Tony Finau, Colin Morikawa, and Jason Day. Morikawa shortened from twenty eight to twenty four. Mm-hmm. I had him at like 27. So I thought the 28 was like just enough uh, to want to get there. Frankly, I'd still bet him at 24. I think it's fine. Um, I was just, you know, we kind of joked about this. We were hoping for a bit of a down week last week for him. He so went we a little jump. too far with it. <laughs> <laughs> went a little bit far on that. Um, Jason Day's down from 34 to 29. or uh, So he was 36. Yeah. And then he got up to 41 and now he's 29. Okay. Um, that's that's interesting, but the name that still shows a little bit of value for me is Tony Finau. Um, believe it or not, he's actually pretty accurate off the tee, despite being really long. He's fifth over the past fifty rounds in this field in strokes gained approach. He's ninth in putting. He's like a John Rom light in the sense of like very long off the tee, but actually pretty accurate as well. Uh, great irons, and right now a great putter. So. I still like Fino. And again, I still like Morikawa and Day, just not as much as I did um, on Monday. Morikawa is pretty obvious for the setup here. He's got driving accuracy. He's got iron play. The odds are now they're about accurate for where he's been. Uh, 28, it was a little bit little bit long. Um, so 
you know, situation to buy in on. Maybe there's, maybe there's lengthen again, but I guess the, the genie's out of the bottle there. It's probably going to be 24 or shorter for, for more Kawa. And then for day, uh, someone we've, we've been talking about a lot over our DFS podcast. Uh, talking and... about a lot today as well. We will be. <laughs> um, <clears throat> former winner here doing a lot with a putter right now, but pretty accurate off the tee four straight top tens, which again, I don't like to cite as like proof of good play with the caveat for day it is a lot of the putter uh, doing the work for him, but that's not to say that the tee to green game is bad. So those are the three guys that I'm looking at toward the top of the board. <clears throat> and despite the high variance, I think throwing a lot of darts, probably not the way I'm going to go right. uh, for this week. Cause I'm not really seeing a ton of value on the long shots, maybe like a, a very partial unit wager on someone like a Matt Kuchar, but I spoiler alert. I like him as a top 20. So probably rather just go that route, I guess. Digging quickly into Fina, who is 28 to one right now at FanDuel Sportsbook doesn't have a good history at TPC Sawgrass, but as you mentioned, it's pretty volatile. Yeah. Um, is that the reason you're okay overlooking that? Because like we know, we talk about this a lot in our other show, but like course history will never trump current form for us. And Tony Fina's current form is elite, better than it's ever been. Is that the bigger reason you're overlooking the current the the course history? Is it because it's a volatile event? Um, what kind of pushes you over the edge with Fina? Almost nobody has great and consistent form at TPC Sawgrass. Mm-hmm. Again, I don't want to just throw like throw my hands up and say, look, it's volatile, so who, who knows? But right. <clears throat> uh, there's not a lot of great form uh, consistently at TPC Sawgrass. Like, yes, the better players tend to separate long-term, but it's not necessarily like one of those spots where it's uh, like, um, you know, here are like the five guys who are sort of can't miss every year because yeah. it's just, it doesn't work that way yeah. at this setup. Okay. Let's shift our focus now and talk about some non-outrights. I mean, look at those over at FanDuel Sports with Brandon. Anybody stand out to you there? Uh, so I got a group bet, Group G. Uh, that's Siwoo Kim, Chris Kirk, Tommy Fleetwood, and Kurt Kitayama. I like Siwoo Kim there at plus 210. Uh, you know, former winner here, but very accurate off the tee. Great tee to green game uh, overall. The putter for him. Not particularly good right now, but I'm fine to bank on the accuracy in the tee to green game uh, for Siwoo Kim versus the rest there at, at what I view as a good number. I have him around uh, plus uh, 200, so uh, plus 210 I'll take there. Yeah, that is Siwoo Kim at plus 210. Chris Kirk is in there, recent winner. Uh, Tommy Fleetwood, Kirk Kitayama. This is all just the recent winners, apparently, because Kirk uh, <laughs> Kitayama went last week. Kirk won like two weeks ago. Kim uh, won not too long ago either. So all the recent winners and Tommy Fleetwood lumped together uh, for Siwoo Kim plus 210. And that one, anything else you like right now? As I mentioned, Matt Kuchar, top 20, uh, plus 360. Has the right game for TPC Sawgrass still. Uh, one here. Uh, in the past, back in, I think, 2012, uh, if memory serves. Uh, a bit worse lately at TPC Sawgrass, but again, doesn't really matter there. Um, he's 36th in accuracy, 57th in stroke skiing Tita Green over the past 50 rounds. That's a good enough combo uh, with the course knowledge uh, to, to go to Kucher. It's a really tough week to find a lot of value. Um, yeah. Maybe that stuff sort of softens up closer to Thursday. But right now, things are pretty tight. The only other thing that I'm kind of seeing is I will be throwing a partial unit dart on Joel Damon, first round leader at plus 190. He's got a good good game for this uh, course. Good ball striker, pretty accurate off the tee. So um, not seeing a ton. And it's in, it's important to you know flag that and, and not get weird if you don't have to. But uh, yeah, that's kind of where I am for right now as of Tuesday. I had to toss the control F out there to find Damon. He is 120 to one to be the first round leader uh, for Joel Damon. Uh, What puts you on Damon as far as being a guy who could lead after uh, Thursday's action? Well, I have a first round uh, model sim, which kind of shows some, a little bit of value there, but he's, he can, he can get, he can get hot. Um, But again, good T to green game generally, uh, very accurate. The, the irons right now not particularly strong, but should be good in a good position off the tee um, for for Damon. So 
that's kind of the angle there is uh, hitting fairways and figuring out the irons. And it's been a, a rough little stretch here for Damon, but outside of the Arnold Palmer hasn't been because of ball striking. The ball striking for Damon has still been pretty good. It's been more so putting, which is kind of, you know, how things go with him uh, pretty often. But Joel Damon, 120 to one to be the first round leader, a potential spot Brandon is okay. Tossing a sprinkle a sprinkle out there for this week. That's all we got here for the Players' Championship and tonight across the NBA. So, Brandon, I want to thank you once again for swinging by, uh, spreading your uh, plentiful knowledge. Uh, good luck tonight. We'll talk to you once again in the very near future. Thank you. By very near future, I mean in a couple minutes. We'll talk about the, the DFS side of things over on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed. You can find Brandon on Twitter at Cadula13. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. Tomorrow's show going up in the afternoon, talking to Ed Fang about uh, some men's college basketball conference tournament stuff. We'll get you set for that and talk to Ed and get his thoughts then. We'll talk to you all very soon. Good luck with the NBA tonight. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 